Now, our next guest has supported the Ready Summit since day one. Not only did he lead the organization that has partnered with us, but he was one of the very first keynote speakers to speak at the summit. Now we welcome him back to center stage as we introduce to you today the CEO of the David Suzuki Foundation, Peter Robinson. I didn't know better, I'd say you had a lot of coffee already. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are great. Um, well, this is the third year that the David Suzuki Foundation has partnered with the City of Richmond and the uh, uh, Richmond School District to put on the Ready Summit. I am so delighted that uh, we've continued to have this happen each year. I'm uh, really overjoyed that the Musqueam uh, Nation has joined us as well. So I've been involved since the first year. As was just said, I was a keynote speaker at the very first uh, event. Last year, David's daughter, uh, Sarika Kala Suzuki, was the speaker. This year, it's David. So you can see that the family and the David Suzuki Foundation have a real uh, profile in this event for as long as it's been put on. And we've enjoyed this amazing partnership over the years uh, with the city of Richmond. And I just want to say a few things about what that partnership looks like, simply because you live in an amazing community. You may not know this, but we look at the foundation at cities across the country and see how they try to uh, integrate environment and sustainability into their governance, how they run their cities. And Richmond ranks right up there at the top in terms of how they are trying to do this. For example, they've pushed so hard to get rapid transit right down through the Canada line into the center of the business district. They've introduced district energy into new buildings and developments uh, in, in, the, in the city. They've, been with, they've had composting for single family homes and townhomes since 2010. Richmond has preserved almost 5,000 acres of farmland within the city boundaries, which encompasses 247 working farms. And they've also got this amazing celebrated uh, nature park and even a nature preschool. I have to tell you, that ranks really high in terms of what we look at for how cities try to integrate uh, environment and sustainability into what they do. And we really applaud such initiatives. Uh, this event is likewise part of that thinking. Uh, the Ready Summit is youth-led. It's done by these wonderful folks in the green t-shirts. And uh, they've helped put this on uh, for three years. And I know the team that's here today has been working on it for almost a year now. So I, uh, again, I just want to really uh, thank you for that. I hope you enjoy your day. There's a number of workshops that the David Suzuki Foundation is putting on as it relates to seafood and climate change, environmental rights, and of course, our queen of green, Lindsay Coulter, is here. So thank you, enjoy your summit, and I look forward to seeing uh, some of you after David's speech. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Oh. No, go for it. And now the moment you've been all been waiting for. He's come a long way here to be for this event, but he's available to wow your mind and answer your questions. Having swept the globe with his insights and sustainability, this world-renowned environmentalist has been an outstanding example to people everywhere about how important and easy green living can be. Please give a warm welcome to the sensational, the incredible, David, David Suzuki. Suzuki. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you all for coming out. It, this time of day, on such a beautiful day, I know you'd uh, love to be outside, and, and you will soon. This, uh, this morning will pass very quickly. As you know, uh, April 22nd is Earth Day, and the week that now spans that date is called Earth Week. April is now designated as Earth Month, and this year we're talking about 2014 being Earth Year. And let us then celebrate Earth. Let's celebrate this part of Earth that is the traditional territory of the coastal First Nations, the Salish people, who were nurtured and cared for 
and who in turn took care of this part of uh, the planet. First of all, congratulations to the youth of, of Richmond for taking part in this event and especially the ambassadors who've worked so hard to, uh, to make the event possible. Thank you very much for all of that and well done. And I'm proud that the David Suzuki Foundation has been a part of uh, these events now for, for three years. Congratulations to the Richmond School District for what is uh, for paying attention to all of the ways that we could save uh, energy and save money by doing things as simple as being sure to turn out the lights when no one's there and, and uh, changing the old uh, uh, boiler system and so on. And as was mentioned, you've saved a lot of money over the past six years. This has been by lightening the footprint of the district. And uh, I think that you've become a model then for school districts all across the country to try to, uh, to follow. And congratulations on Richmond. You've got a progressive set of, of leaders now and enacting, as Peter mentioned, the very uh, progressive acts that are being taken by the city to lighten its footprint. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored to have the opportunity to come here and to thank you and for uh, the chance to address you. I'm very proud and pleased at the role the David Suzuki Foundation has played and is playing in this event each year. But today, I have to tell you, I am not speaking on behalf of or for the David Suzuki Foundation or any other group. I came to speak to you today as a grandfather and as an elder. And I think this is the most important time and role of my life. You see, an elder is no longer worried about getting fired or not getting a raise next year or getting a promotion. They're not worried about making people mad if you say something that they don't like. Because now we are freed to speak truth that comes from the heart. And our biggest priority now as elders is focused on what kind of a world are we leaving to our grandchildren and all of the young kids around the world. And so that's uh, how I've chosen to address you today as a grandfather and an elder. I'm often asked by young people, what can I do to protect the environment? Well, we need all people in society in all kinds of activities to be concerned about how to protect the environment. So I answer them when they ask me, follow your heart. In, being an environmentalist is not a special discipline or activity. It's not like being a doctor or a, a plumber or a garage mechanic. Being an environmentalist is about seeing our place on the planet. And we need all people to see that, uh, the planet that way and our relationship with it. So the answer is we have to be more thoughtful about the way that we are living on the earth, the way we interact with our surroundings and with each other. So in many small ways, each of you can do what the school district has been doing, turn off the lights when you leave the room and there's no one else there. When you're brushing your teeth, turn, on the turn off the tap uh, between uh, uh, brushes. There are eat, uh, eat organic, uh, uh, try to get rid of the disposable things, don't, don't buy disposable things. There are all kinds of ways that you can each reduce your footprint or your impact on the planet. But many bigger decisions are made by the people your parents elect to office, politicians who represent us and should be looking out for our best interest. We, in a democracy, we vote for people to make decisions on our behalf. I'm in the last part of my life, and whatever politicians do or do not do today is going to have very little impact on my life. But what their decisions are, their priorities, will reverberate throughout your entire lives. You are the ones who are going to feel the impact most by what politicians are doing today. 
For example, climatologists have been urging politicians to take steps to reduce greenhouse gases, to uh, reduce our impact on the climate ever since the 1980s. And their warnings and, and uh, urgings have become louder and more, uh, more desperate as uh, time has gone by. And, at the, and there has been a response. We see it in the way that Peter talked about Richmond's uh, activities now. We see it in Vancouver, striving to be the greenest city in the world by 2020. And we see it in, in cities like Edmonton and, and uh, Calgary that have elected young, vigorous uh, mayors. So at the municipal levels across the country, we are seeing politicians taking action. It's harder at the uh, provincial level, but here in British Columbia, we had a premier, uh, Gordon Campbell, who enacted uh, a carbon tax. He said, if we're going to put carbon in the air through burning fossil fuels, we should pay to put that in the air. And it has worked. It has generated revenue, although he gave it back to us. But he, it has also induced people to reduce their use of cars or transportation that burns uh, fossil fuels. Politicians are, are taking steps in uh, several provinces to build more windmills, solar panels, and so on. We, uh, but at the federal level especially, we see politicians have come and gone, and they've said, oh yes, yes, we've got to uh, do something uh, about the climate, but they have done actually very, very little. And the problem with the whole issue of the changing climate is that our failure to act is going to affect most strongly young people. Because this is a more slow motion effect. We're not going to see the immediate effect of not doing anything uh, next year or the year after. You can see the, um, the, the sorry, the, uh, at the federal level, the problem is that politicians are often driven by global events over which uh, uh, we have very little impact, but we're influenced by global events, especially the global economy. And they forget or they ignore the issues that will affect you the most. You see, when any person is elected to office, the first thing they have to worry about is who's going to vote for me in the next election? Because their priority is to get reelected. And so the focus is on doing things that will have an impact on potential voters so that they will get those votes. So everything is done in a short-sighted way in order to pay off with more voters in the next election. You don't vote. And it's going to be a long time before you will ever vote. So it's not that politicians are stupid or mean people. It's that the game of politics, the nature of politics, means they can't worry about your future when they've got to worry about people who are going to vote for them. So I think one of your biggest challenges, since youth don't vote, and yet you will be most affected by what is done by politicians, I think your biggest challenge is to get the two most important people on the planet, your mom and dad, to speak out on your behalf. They love you. And so they must become equal warriors on your behalf. And if they don't vote, or if they don't think this is an important issue, that is your challenge. You've got to persuade them in some way that by not voting, by not worrying about the environment, they're also not worrying about your future. So I think this can be the most effective thing that young people can do because it's your future that's at stake. This is a time, Earth Week, to remember the bounty and the generosity of what First Nations people call Mother Earth. When I first heard people talk about Mother Earth, I thought, oh, that's a beautiful way. It's a poetic way or a metaphoric way of speaking about this planet. But uh, the more I thought about it, I realized indigenous people around the world who refer to the Earth as our mother mean it literally. They believe 
that we are born out of the earth. We're given birth from the earth, and the best science we have uh, confirms that this is absolutely true. I, um, I was swept up in the environmental movement in 1962 when I read a book by a woman named Rachel Carson called Silent Spring. And here in British Columbia, I've been involved in many battles fighting against drilling for oil in Hecate Strait and a dam at Sightsee on the Peace River and, and uh, uh, stopping super tank, uh, oil tankers coming from Alaska to Seattle, uh, pollution from pulp mills, and so on. I, I thought that what we needed were laws to regulate how people act to the environment. We had to control what we remove from the environment and control what wastes and, and toxic chemicals we put back into it. But if Earth is our mother and we are created out of the Earth, what indigenous people call the sacred elements, Earth, air, fire, and water, then what is our most important need? Is there the environment out there and we have to uh, interact with it. I realized through thinking of Earth as our mother and we're being born out of the Earth that there is no separation. We are. There is no environment separated from us. That it's all a part of who we are. Now that may seem mysterious and uh, you may wonder what I'm talking about. So what do you kids right here, what do you think is the most important thing that every person on the planet needs. What's the most important thing? Water is, is one. Yes? Air. The moment every one of us left our mother's body, we needed air. The first breath we take inflates our lungs because we've been living in a watery environment inside our mothers, but we inflate our lungs and then yell, we have arrived. We announce our arrival, and from that moment on, 15 to 40 times a minute, we need air to the last breath we take before we die. And we don't think much about that. I want you to think about what happens when you take a breath of air. It's so easy, right? Two to three, four liters of air deep down into our lungs. I don't know if you've ever seen the lungs of, a, of an animal that's been freshly killed, but they're kind of funny organs. You know, you push them and they're kind of mushy, squishy. They feel funny, but why do they feel so strange? Because they're primarily made of air. The lungs are, a grown-up's lungs are made of about 200 million little uh, compartments that we call alveoli. They're, they're clustered like grapes around an alveolar duct, and there are 200 million of them in our lungs. And each alveolus is lined with a three-layered membrane called a surfactant. And the surfactant is sticky, so when the air hits it, it sticks. And then uh, immediately carbon dioxide from our bodies rushes out, oxygen and whatever else is in the air rushes in. Hemoglobin molecules in red blood cells grab onto the oxygen, and with each breath we take, or each beat of our heart, that oxygen is pumped to all parts of our bodies. And when we breathe out, we don't breathe all of the air in our lungs out. If we did that, our lungs would collapse. About half of the air stays in your lungs even when you breathe out. And so the point I'm making is air isn't something that's out there. We can't draw a line and say, here's where the air ends and I begin. There is no line. Air is in us, it's stuck to us, and it's circulating through our bodies all the time. We are air. And of course, when I breathe out, the air that comes out of my nose very quickly mixes in this room and goes straight up your nose. And when I tell young people, I can see young people go, oh, yuck. <laughs> you know, we don't walk around with a big bubble of air that belongs to Johnny or Mary. The air is this matrix all around us. We are embedded in it. It is in us. It is circulating through us. So if I am air and you are air, we are 
each other. We're embedded in this thin layer of air that circles the planet, not just with each other. We're in that air sharing it with the, with the uh, uh, birds and the trees and the snakes and the worms and the automobiles and the trucks and the planes. We're sharing that same air. We are air. And that's a very different way of looking at the world from what I did when I first became uh, involved in environmental issues. If I, I often tell children, you know, uh, if you want to see how important air is, take a deep breath, now hold it, and don't breathe for five minutes. And I'm going to keep on talking, and you just, you know, and children are so trusting, you know, you see them with their cheeks puffed out, and after a while they start turning pink and then red, and then eventually they go, ah, they have to take a breath. Air is so important. If you don't have air for more than four minutes, you die. Your air is so important, your body will not let you kill yourself by deliberately holding your breath. Your body will not allow you to do that. We need air, and it's, it makes us who we are. How can it be then, when air is so important for us and all other living creatures, that we will use air to dump, to pour, some of the most toxic chemicals ever known on, on this planet. It doesn't make any sense, does it? When you think about it, why would we treat air that way? Protecting the air, if you breathe polluted air and you keep doing this constantly, you're sick. How many children here have asthma? There you go. You very well know whatever we put into the air is going to affect us. And it's amazing to me that we have a prime minister now who has had asthma since childhood. And any person with asthma should understand very clearly that we have to treat the air with much greater care and respect. Because we are air, and whatever we do to the air, we do to ourselves. And it's the same thing. Someone mentioned water. We can go longer without water than we can go without air. But you'll still, you need air, water within three or four days or you die. And we are all at least 60% water by weight. We're just a big blob of water with enough thickener added so we don't dribble away on the floor. We are water. And of course, where does the water? We have to keep drinking water because water leaks out of our eyes and our mouth and our nose and our, and, um, our other parts. And, uh, and so we have to keep drinking water to, to fill up. And where do you think that water comes from? Do you think it's Richmond water? Do you think it's Vancouver water? Of course, water through one of the hydrologic cycle that evaporates, forms clouds, rains on the land, evaporates, water cartwheels around the earth. And wherever you get your water, it will have molecules that have come from all of the oceans of the world, from all of the, the canopies of forests and, and uh, wetlands around the world. We are water, and through water, we're connected to all life on this planet, and yet we treat water as a way of getting rid of our waste and toxic material, dumping it into it. Doesn't make sense when you understand we are water. What you do to the water, we do to ourselves. And we are the earth. Every bit of our nutrition, everything that we need to form our bodies was once living. We receive life, we create our bodies through other life forms. We take the carcasses of plants and animals, we tear them apart in our mouths, and then we incorporate those plants and animals into our bodies. And most of what we eat is grown in the soil so that we are the, related to the earth through the plants that we consume. And so, again, we, uh, we know that this is important if you go without food for more than several weeks, you, you can't live. If you have to eat contaminated food, you get sick. And yet we use the soil to dump many of our toxic wastes. And uh, whatever we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. So we have another thing that is absolutely crucial to our survival and well-being, 
every bit of the, you know, you need energy in order to move and jump and play and, and to grow and to later on have children. All of the energy that, that, uh, that we need for that is sunlight. Sunlight captured by plants through photosynthesis and converted then into chemical energy and we then get that energy by eating the plants or eating the animals that eat the plants. And we store the sun's energy in our bodies. And when we need that energy, we burn it. We literally burn it and get the energy of the sun back out again. And so uh, this is what we now know. And this is what I have come to learn through the perspective of indigenous people that the earth is our mother that the earth is our mother because through the earth we get the four, what they call the four sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water. We are the earth. And the amazing miracle for me is that what provides these four sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water, what cleanses this, replenishes it, creates those four elements, is life. The web of living things around the world creates or cleanses or replenishes the very things that we need to survive. Simple example, Vancouver gets its water from three watersheds surrounded by old growth rainforest. And when the water falls from the uh, from the, from the rain falls on the earth, then the tree roots and other plant roots and soil fungi and bacteria absorb materials from that and cleanse the water so that we can drink it. It's nature that creates or cleanses that water for us to use. And so it is with the, the air without plants in the oceans and on, and on land. Animals like us would never survive. It's plants in photosynthesis that remove carbon dioxide from the air and put oxygen that we desperately need so that we can uh, survive. So it's life, this web of living things that creates or gives us the four sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And First Nations people in Canada refer to other animals as our brothers and sisters. They refer to, to trees and plants as our relatives. And you know, I'm a geneticist and I study heredity and DNA. And what's amazing is that when we look at DNA, we find that we are indeed related to all other life forms. That most of our genes from a bacterium to a cedar tree to an eagle or a salmon, most of the genes that we have, we have in common. They are our relatives. And surely we treat our relatives with respect and care. If we don't regard them as resources, they're our kin. And so we should be much more careful with them. The biosphere, the zone of air, water, and land, where all life exists, is, uh, is I believe, alive. The earth, the planet, is alive. It's made up of perhaps 30 million different species of plants and animals, all overlapping and interconnecting and interdependent. And those, that web of living things is nourished by other, each other, as well as by what comes from the earth. We are powered by the sun and we are inflated by water. So looking at the world this way, the, the forests of the earth become the lungs of the planet, just as our lungs serve each of us. And rivers become a part of the great circulatory system, moving liquid across the terrestrial parts of the earth. Today we are celebrating the Fraser River, and uh, if Mr. Sparrow said it right, it's the Stalo. Uh, the Stalo is the river, this great river of life. The Fraser is one of the great rivers of this earth. And when you think of it, it begins way up in the mountains. And flowing off that mountains, it gathers strength as it's contributed by creeks and little, little streams and distributing moisture along the way to the dry areas. 
that uh, great body of water that finally results as habitat for all kinds of fish, all kinds of, of animals and, and plants. And it, it takes the, the water that leaches off fields of, uh, of the farmers and, uh, and uh, finally uh, carries sediment down here. Richmond and Steveston would not exist if it wasn't for the Fraser River. Thousands of years ago, there was no great delta here. This land that's been built up is the contribution of the great Fraser River. Surely that in itself should be enough for us to show great respect and concern about the Fraser. This waterway is, one of, is the home to one of Earth's greatest biological spectacles, the migration of spawning sockeye salmon the most valued species of salmon in the world. You know, they turn the spectacular red as they get close to their spawning grounds. And we now think that if we have a run of 30 to 35 million sockeye in one season, that is a terrific run. But evidence indicates before contact with Europeans that there may have been five times that many salmon that ran up the Fraser River. And imagine the dozens and dozens of villages and tribal people who gathered at the river waiting for this great gift that came from the sea, the sockeye salmon. The Fraser is home to the largest freshwater fish in North America, the great sturgeon. These great animals that, uh, that still inhabit, that Rick Hansen is, is uh, trying very hard to, uh, to protect and and uh, replenished. When I was a boy growing up in Vancouver, this is back in the late 1930s, Dad and I would run down to New Westminster and we'd catch sturgeon all the time like this. But of course today, sturgeon are not nearly as plentiful, but they're one of the great uh, uh, fish uh, in the world that's, that, are, uh, that grow and live in the Fraser River. The Fraser is home to the Ulican a smelt-like fish about this big that is so rich in fat that when you dry them out, you can light a match and you can actually burn them like a candle. And for First Nations people along the coast, the fat of the ulican is one of the most prized things they have. They call it grease, and the gre there's a grease trail where ulican grease was taken to the interior and traded for things that the coastal people wanted uh, back and forth, a huge part of the of the economy then of uh, coastal First Nations. Through the Fraser, we see how everything is connected, the air, the water, and the land. And so, if we are aware then of the most precious needs that we have, that our very life and well-being depends on the sacred elements and our relatives, the plants and animals, then once we recognize that, we show gratitude. We're grateful to Mother Earth for what she provides us. And I think we become more thoughtful about the way that we live on our mother. More and more, we have separated ourselves from nature. And the ultimate of this, a friend of mine lives in north, a northern part of Toronto. And he said, you know, David, I, I live in a high-rise apartment that's completely air-conditioned. When I go to work, I go down the elevator into the basement, I get into an air-conditioned car, drive down the Don, Don Valley Freeway into my office building, which is in the commercial area, into the basement, into my office that's completely air-conditioned, and that office building is connected through tunnels to shopping areas, shopping malls. He said, you know, I don't have to go outside for weeks. You think about that. We are being so separated from the world and now more and more there are challenges of, of uh, our television and computer and cell phones, all kinds of things to distract us from the outside. We are so fortunate here that we are really lucky to live in a place like Richmond and Vancouver where we have the Fraser River. The Fraser River is a place to go and play and see the importance and to fall in love with this great river system. We lived, I live in Kitsilano, where I've lived in the same place for 35 years. When my children were growing up, I would look at the charts and see when we had a very low tide 
and I'd arrange for the teachers to take the classes down to uh, the beach at low tide. <clears throat> we live right on the, on the ocean. And I was amazed at how many children who live in Vancouver had never been down to the beach at low tide and who were shocked when I rolled over a rock and they go, whoa, there are crabs there and blennies and, and sea anemones right there in Vancouver, right on the shore. So lots of opportunity. We're very lucky to still have nature. You have Burns Bog here. We still have forests. Uh, Richmond, as Peter mentioned, has tried to protect large bits of, of nature. We have to reconnect with nature to see how wonderful nature is, how generous nature is, and how we must take much greater care of Mother Nature. So if I can end, please get outside, especially on a, a beautiful day like this, and be sure to take mom and dad with you so that they can also learn the lesson of connectivity. Thank you very much for coming. Did you want to have a question and answer? Thank you. Thank you for your inspiring words, David. Can I, can I call you David? I, I feel, I, I've, I've, only, I've only just met David uh, backstage a couple minutes ago, but uh, uh, his words make me feel like I've known him all my <laughs> life. <laughs> I can feel that connection between us. <laughs> we heard from David's Suzuki Foundation that David loves to brainstorm with kids and young people because he thinks we're the best. So, we have, a, uh, we have selected a couple questions from our Green Ambassadors, speech contest contestants, uh, as well as the remote location students for you. Uh, and we have the utmost confidence that uh, you can answer them uh, with the same suavity and well, wisdom you're, that we've You're putting me know. under pressure now. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> Here's our first question from our primary speech contest contestant, Keanu McDonald from Woodward Elementary. Hi. If you could be any animal, what would it be and why? Ah. Well, I think I'd like to be a seagull. Because they eat seafood all the time. And I've always wanted to fly. Not in an airplane, but to fly myself. Wouldn't that be wonderful, to fly like a plane? But I think there are many, many different kinds of uh, animals that we could, we could want to be, and that just happens to be one of my selections. Thank you. Now, I must say, seagulls do eat a lot of garbage as well. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Kiana, for the question, and thank you, David, for the response. Uh, we, would like to, uh, we would like now to introduce uh, our next question from uh, Anjali Menon, our grade 7 speech contestant from Debec Elementary. Dr. Suzuki, how do you see our role as students and environmental stewards in this region? Well, I think that uh, if you are what we call an environmentalist, then obviously the big role is to educating your fellow students who aren't. I think that we all ultimately have to become aware of our place in nature and our dependence on nature for the things that really matter. So that's a, a process of, of education, as I say. So much of education seems to be about preparing you for jobs and preparing you to take your place in the grown-up world. But we forget these very, very fundamental things. So for all of you that are wearing the green shirts here today, you're already taking charge and becoming a part of that education process, inviting all these others here and providing them with an opportunity to have workshops and to hear, hear speakers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Anjali. Our next question comes from Vincent. He is a grade 12 student from Richmond Secondary. Grade 11. Oh, 
Grade, grade 11. <laughs> What got you interested in sustainability in the first place? Oh gosh, you know, there's no sudden magic moment when you go, ah, I gotta worry about sustainability. I think for me, for me the most important thing is that my father loved uh, camping and fishing and gardening. So uh, from the earliest time I can remember when I was four in Vancouver, we were going camping. And it was that kind of being outside that fostered a, a love of nature. Now, I used to call my father, I used to say, Dad, you're a mutation. You know, because his, my grandparents came from Japan in about 1904. And as with most new immigrants, my grandparents, their whole thing was, you've got to work hard, you've got to work hard to make money and you make money to get a home and security and make sure the kids go to school and get good, a good education and a profession. And I think that continues to the present time that new immigrants to Canada are most concerned with security and, and establishing a place uh, in the society. And so my father, for some reason, he was the eldest in the family, he still loved to go camping and fishing. And I can remember my grandparents bawling him out and saying, why did you take David and go fishing when you could have been working and making money? And I feel I was very, very lucky that my dad was different and, and he just had this love of, of nature and fishing. And I think that's the, the most crucial thing, that when you establish a love of nature and you begin to see what's happening to our forests, or now especially the oceans, then you can't help but be worried about that because those are important things in your life. So that's what it was for me. Thank you. Thank you once again, David, for your response, and Vincent for the question. Uh, our next question actually comes from these uh, Surrey Kwantlen campus that we have for you here today. Um, their group of students asks, um, can the use of new technologies inhibit or enhance the protection of the Fraser and other waterways? What role does it play in sustainability? Well, I think there's no question that we have very, very serious environmental problems today, from climate change to the state of the ocean to, uh, to uh, our great freshwater systems. We, there are many, many problems, and we are going to, to require technology uh, to help us restore and uh, protect many of these areas. The problem we face is this. When we bring in big technology, we always find that there are unexpected consequences because we, we fail to see the, we don't know enough about the big picture. Let me give you some examples. When the, the atomic bomb was developed, that was a great discovery that if you break open atoms, you can release the energy. And if you ha were able to do that in a controlled way, you could explode in a bomb. But when the bombs were dropped over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, we didn't know there was a thing called radioactive fallout. That was found years later. We didn't know that there were electromagnetic pulses of gamma rays that knock out electrical circuits. We didn't know that enough cloud would be, ash would be thrown up to cause a nuclear winter. All of that was discovered after we had started to exploit atomic power. Remember when, when uh, DDT and, and pesticides began to be used, We'd, we thought, oh, this is really smart. You know, we're going to control insects. Well, first of all, you can't just spray on a, a farmer's field and not have that DDT go somewhere else. Insects are one of the most important groups of uh, animals on the planet. They pollinate flowering plants. They feed many, many species. They're very, very important. It, it's crazy to try to kill pests on a farmer's field and affecting butterflies and honeybees and everything. I mean, and we only discovered there was a thing called biomagnification. You spray at low concentrations, but at, as that DDT passes up the food chain, it gets concentrated. So by the time you get to the breasts of, of women and the shell glands of birds, you've concentrated DDT many, many times. 
And then when eagles began to disappear, scientists traced it down and discovered it was DDT. So we, we keep going for technology and then discovering, oh my goodness, it's got consequences. But I still say we need technology and there's a very exciting way to approach technology, I believe. It's called biomimicry. Bio meaning life, mimic meaning copy. Life has been on the planet for almost four billion years and every species has the same problem as we do. How do you get food? What do you do when you get sick? Uh, how do you have children? Uh, th these are all, what do you do with your waste? These, every species has this problem. But life has had billions of years to solve these problems. Maybe if we went and said, we got a problem with pollution. How do you do it, deal with it, nature? What do you do? We will find solutions that are much more in, in balance with the environment than the kind of heavy technology that we tend to use. So I would say we need a different kind of technology. Thank you very much, David. Our next question comes from New Westminster. Protecting the Fraser and the rest of the environment depends on a balancing act. What does that mean and how can we accomplish it? So we, ha we have to balance, it seems to me, the way that humans use the river and what the river needs to remain uh, healthy and, and, and free. I think the problem we face today in many areas, for example, uh, let's say that we're, if we're looking at the, um, the Fraser, we're going and get all of the people who have direct uh, um, vested interests in the Fraser. So you get transportation, you'll get uh, uh, energy, uh, we're trying to transport uh, energy in various ways, and one of them is to use barges on, on the Fraser River. Uh, there'll be, there'll be uh, uh, fishermen, uh, sports fishermen, commercial fishermen. Uh, there are many, many groups that have an interest in the Fraser. The problem that I see in all of this is uh, an approach that the British Columbia government used many years ago, and that is when we have a problem, let's say, what do we do with this forest? Uh, we, we set up what we call round tables of all of the stakeholders, the people with an interest in that particular area. And then basically what we do is we fight it out and try to come to, to some kind of uh, agreement in the end. The problem with that is we're fighting with human beings to say my area is more important than yours. I'm a businessman, I need the Fraser for my business. Or I'm a fisherman, I want those sockeye to come. So we're all fighting. We, if we started with a different way of looking at it to say the Fraser River is this most precious thing and its health and everything in it, the health of that is directly related to our ability to use it. As long as the Fraser is healthy and, and abundant, then we can all take a part of it or use it in different ways. But too often, our own interest comes before everything else. And we forget that the river, meanwhile, is being degraded. So we need a different way of looking at how we deal with these issues. And the Fraser has been very, very heavily impacted by, by human activity, thoughtless human activity. You know, we don't, oh, I, I can make some money right here on the, you know, the banks of the river and I can build a house or whatever and dump whatever I want into the river. No, we've got to look at it in a very different way. Thank you, David. Are the people here going to get a chance to ask? Or do we oh, <laughs> well, we, uh, we had to select uh, a few from, uh, from the steering committee that we okay. chose, uh, just for time's sake. Okay. We do have one last question for you uh, that comes from a group of green ambassadors uh, from Steveston, London. Uh, and, they, uh, would, and they remark that um, you've been an environmentalist for many decades now. Uh, you've worked hard uh, at keeping the earth sustainable. But at, at any point did you wish to give up? And what keeps, or what keeps you going uh, in this field? Well, I, there are many times when we feel very, very sad. Uh, we have had many battles and we've lost many battles. But 
uh, you know, it, this isn't a job. It, it, it's, it's not something you can say, okay, I've done my best, I'm walking away from it. Because I have children who never asked to be born. I brought them into this world. And it seems to me every generation of parents hoped to be able to get, get our children to have a better life, to receive a future that was better than the one that we had. But in the process, we forgot that it's nature that is ultimately the so our wealth, our prosperity, depends on the air, the water, the soil, other creatures. And we ignored that in order to get ahead in very limited way in terms of money or material goods. And so I feel, just as a father and a grandfather, I have no choice but to carry on doing the best I can for the sake of my children and grandchildren. Because I know that I leave a world that is radically different from the one I grew up in when I was a child. As I said, I used to be able to go down and fish for sturgeon right in New Westminster. New Westminster wasn't a city back then, but we could go to the docks and fish for sturgeon. We used to catch salmon, you know, just out in English Bay. We used to catch halibut off Spanish banks. You know, the world, the, the, the world, I couldn't pass that on to my children and grandchildren. And so I have no choice. It's, I have to do everything I can for my grandchildren. And I have no great conceit that I'm the one that's got to save the world. I'm one person. I just do the best I can. And um, one way of trying to amplify the work that I'm doing was to set up a foundation which is being supported by just ordinary Canadians. And that expands uh, the impact that I can have. But we're a small organization. We can only do the best we can. And so that's why I am honored to have the chance to meet with you today. And I hope if any of my words make any sense to you, if it, it opened any of your eyes, then we can go out. And you all increase the effort that I make. So yes, it has been discouraging in the past. But I, when I come here today, I just feel, yes. <laughs> Let's go for it. Let's do it. Thank you all very, very, well very, said, very much. That concludes the Q&A period. Thank you very much for that, David. Those were some very excellent responses. And we want to extend our gratitude and thank all the speakers who have joined us today. But we must give special thanks to David Suzuki for taking time out of his busy schedule uh, to be with us here today at McMath Secondary for the Ready Summit uh, and speaking to all of us. It really means the world to everybody here. And to show our thanks, please accept this small gift from the Green Ambassadors to you. Please give one more round of applause for the fantastic David Suzuki.